Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone of every identity and experience should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. These Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers, who are amazing filmmakers and photographers, researchers, adventurers, scientists, storytellers, you name it. Um, and once we're all together here in the Explorer Classroom, we have a short lesson from the Explorer and an extended Q&A with our students. All summer break long, you'll have Explorer Classroom events every Wednesday and Thursday, plus more cool opportunities you can find at natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. And today, we're very lucky to be joined by Erica Larson. Erica is an amazing photographer and a multiple, multidisciplinary storyteller, excuse me. She's known for her breathtaking images. And she's also known for her essays, which document cultures that maintain close ties with nature. Today, Erica is gonna watch, walk us through some of her work in Alaska so we can get a glimpse of all the research, relationships, and attention that go into her projects. Before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several wonderful student groups, and we have many, many, many more of you out there watching along on YouTube. Our registered students today represent Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Canada, the District of Columbia, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, India, Kenya, Maryland, New Hampshire, New York, the United Kingdom, Virginia, Washington, and, and probably even more places are out there too. So if I happen to miss your state or your country, please say hello and introduce yourself in the chat bar. I would love to say hi and give you folks some shout outs. But I wanna start with a couple shout outs to Jay and Kenny and Sacha and William and Lily, Everest, Mimi from Toronto, um, D. Akash Varden, Arpana, Ben from Wales, all kinds of wonderful people out there, hello. Um, but for now, that is plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Erica Larson for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to do this. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to bring you all to Alaska. And I want to go as well because I've been in my house for the past few months. So this is quite a journey for me. Um, Celeste introduced me a bit. The only thing I would like to say, so I consider myself a storyteller, but I use the camera is what I want to say, almost a magical tool to be able to connect me with the world around me, but also my interior world, my life, my family, the things that are important to me. And it's this amazing tool that helps us learn about everything that's around us. And it, I'd say it feeds our curiosity. So um, let's, I'm going to share my screen now and I'm not gonna say anything else about myself. We're just gonna get on a plane to Alaska. Okay, here we go. And so where are we going to go in Alaska? We are going to a place called Quinnahawk. But next to Quinnahawk, you're going to get a small bonus. There's also something called the Old Village, which in Yupik language is Nunalek. And Nunalik is an archaeological site that's been being excavated for the past 10 years. But what it was, was a Yupik village that went dormant during the time of the Little Ice Age, almost five or 600 years ago. Quinnahawk is a modern day village today with primarily Yupik people. And this Nunalik or the old village, these are their ancestors. So here's this airplane I was just talking about. So in order to get to Quinnahawk, what you have to do is find your way to Anchorage. And then from Anchorage, you take another small plane to a little village called Bethel. But then from Bethel, you have to take another flight um, on a small prop plane like this one. This is looking out the window to get to this village. And what's really important about the village is it's on um, the Bering Sea, the Western coastal uh, edge of Alaska on the Bering Sea. And it's a really small village that you see here in the distance. And then you kind of see the snaking river that goes through it. And that's the Canuck River. And that leads directly into the Bering Sea. Now, why is this important? Once you get off, here we are. This is sort of a on the ground, eye level view. Um, this proximity to the Bering Sea and this Canuck River is really important because the name 
Quinnahawk or um, Gwinnahawk in Yupik means new river channel. And the elders in the village say that until it will be eight times that this village will move until it has a permanent settlement and it's in its fifth incarnation. So what we're seeing right now is because of sea level rising and permafrost melt and its close proximity to the Bering Sea, we're, we're seeing this, these, that river sort of erode and cut into the village. And we're actually seeing these, these houses that you see in the background, they're needing to be moved little by little. And this will happen in a process probably over the next 10 to 20 years. But let's look geographically now, right? We can't be geographic without showing you a map. <laughs> So this is Alaska. Um, as you can see there, we, we right in the middle, you see the border of Canada, but I wanna show you where we're gonna be or where we are. Um, so at the very bottom, you see the Aleutian chain. It's that peninsula at the bottom of Alaska. If you just go a little bit north, um, you'll see Bristol Bay and right above there is Quinnahawk and Nunalik. And um, here we go. Now, this is a bird's eye view. Um, but of the site. So this is what Nunalik looks like today. So what you can imagine, this was a house. This was, it was an underground house, actually, a sod house that housed many generations of Yupik people. And within those many generations, there were extended families that lived there. And this was a prime location because it had the Bering Sea, which would have been great for fishing. And it was also close to a freshwater river for getting fish that way. And there was a lot of game that would have come in. So it was a really prime location. But during the time of the Little Ice Age, resources got really scarce. And there was something that happened amongst the Yupik people themselves called the Bow and Arrow Wars. And it was a war amongst or between Yupik people um, before any contact, before any contact um, into the coast of Alaska. And, um, and this village ended up going dormant. So about 10 years ago, the, the modern day village of Quinnahawk paired up with an archeological team led by Rick Necht. And they decided that this, this village was actually, all these artifacts were coming out of the ground. People would go down and go fishing, go down and hang out on the beach. And like artifacts were literally coming out of the ground, the artifacts of their ancestors, but nobody knew what to do because every winter they would just get washed away by the Bering Sea. So together in this partnership, um, they began to excavate the site and to decide that they wanted to preserve these artifacts. And why is this important? One, that was a big challenge for the community because they were deciding, should we disturb our ancestors or should we just let this, this history, our history go away? And the village came together, a general consensus, no, we want to preserve this because this is what's going to teach our children about where we come from and who we are. But the other important thing is that every artifact that comes out of the ground, which is the largest collection of Yupik artifacts in the world, stays in the village and belongs to the village. So these artifacts don't go to Europe, they don't go to the Smithsonian, they stay within the village. Now, if the village wants to lend them to a larger museum to have on exhibit, that's great. And people can actually visit the village of Quinnahawk and see these artifacts in their home state. And so when you're down on the site, this is what, this is, it's so exciting. Everyone talks about Egypt. This is incredibly exciting because you're getting like a thousand artifacts are coming out of the ground like every week. That is not happening anywhere else in the world, I can promise you. Um, and they're coming out looking like this. This is in situ. So this picture was taken when I was there coming out of the ice. And this is an ulak. This is a woman's knife that she would have used for cutting fish, cutting skin, cutting animals or anything she needed. And what's really beautiful about this ulak is in that the Yupik had this amazing duality in the way that they would create their artwork. Um, take a look, what do you see? Do you see a whale or do you see a seal? And the thing is, is you're seeing both. One side is a whale, but the other side is a seal. And that was the point of the artist. And the reason this is important is because every day villagers, the um, Yupik villagers would come down to the Nunalik site and basically teach the archeologists what they were discovering. So it's their knowledge, it's their understanding of their culture and this rich tradition they have with storytelling within their own um, artwork that is able to inform this, this modern day interpretation of these artifacts. There's a bent wood bowl coming out of the ground in situ. And you'd see lots of um, 
we see lots of masks coming out, but also lots of figurines like this. Okay, but let's, let's, let's go a little bit more to today's time. And this is my job. So I was sent here on assignment for National Geographic magazine, and I was sent here as a storyteller. And um, so what was my story? And I don't, you don't really know, right? The interesting thing about storytelling is I can't tell you what the story is until I've lived it. But I can tell you what I'm interested in understanding. So what I was interested in was this relationship of how the modern day village of Quinnahawk were actually teachers and guides for the archeologists to understand that their, their heritage. And so in order for me to do that, I had to go um, into the village. Like I literally got off a plane, put on my backpack and had to walk around this one mile village and make friends and get to know people. And um, so when I got off the plane, this is sort of my first sight. So this is what the village looks like. And what you're seeing here are the sewer pipes and the water pipes. And they're all above ground because of permafrost. If they were below ground, they'd have much more likelihood of cracking. So they have them above ground because permafrost, even the houses, the reason these houses are raised above ground is because of the permafrost. So when the earth is sort of moving like this, the houses don't break apart. Um, looks like there was in Quinnahawk, Alaska, 99655. And um, in the village has about 600 people. And it's about a mile long. So in one way, I didn't have that much ground to cover, but I was pretty nervous, right? So I show up, I'm obviously like a little out of place because if the village is 600 people, everybody knows each other. But there I am with my backpack, my tripod, my camera. And how do you tell a story? How do you do that? So I walked back and forth, walked back and forth, and I kept coming back to this house right here. And why? Because above the door, if you look really close, you can see that there's a walrus skull with these two tusks. And I was so, I was like, what is this wall? What is this skull? This walrus. And so I knocked on the door and I had no idea who was gonna answer. And this is who answered the door, Fanny and Emma. And they answered and I said, hello. And uh, they, they looked at me and they said, hello. And they said, I'm Erica and I'm, he I'm here with National Geographic. I am learning about the site and I'm really interested in, in, in learning about um, the people here and, and, and what, Quinnahawk, um, what Quinnahawk is all about. And they welcomed me in instantly. And I would actually say, so I have now been working on the story for five years. I went there in 2015, 2020. And the, I, um, I would say they've been my guides for the last five years. Um, this is what it looks like when I got into the house and Emma. And the most important thing is Emma sat me down and she fed me. And this would also for, for, foreshadow my next few years that with any you pick house that I went into, I would be fed. And then they began to talk about the culture. They talked about how important storytelling was for the UPIC people. And you see what Fanny's doing here. She's sitting in the ground and she's telling a story with this knife. And I wanna show you all, I was actually gifted several years later. If you can look at the, I'm not sure if you see me on the screen, but um, this is a UPIC storytelling knife that was gifted to me because I'm a storyteller as well. But what an honor to be able to have been gifted this. And, um, so storytelling traditions are really important to UPIC. And so I had so much to learn from them about what that meant. And the other important thing to, to, to recognize is things like this, these are coming out of the site. So, you know, the, that Nunalik village were, were, had storytelling knives like this coming out. I would meet Frances and her, and her daughter Valerie, and they would take me fishing. I would get to go back to their house and Francis would show me all the different ways they prepare fish during different seasons. Again, now I've been visiting over five years. So I've been to Quinnahawk in many different times of the year, but Sunalik is something they make in the summertime. It's a salted fish and then they can pull it out in the winter and eat it. I would go fishing with Mike and he was incredible because he was actually, so a lot of the young villagers are working at the Nunalik site alongside the archeologists. And Mike is one of those youth that's been working uncovering artifacts since the very beginning. So he is like this amazing um, storyteller for me of everything that's coming out. Um, and then I would meet Sarah Brown and Sarah Brown would be the woman that I would end up living with over the years when I would go back. So now I'm not allowed to stay at the school or the red, the community building. I have to stay at Sarah's house. And what did Sarah show me? 
her drawer of Ulocks. You remember that first artifact we saw in the beginning? She pulled out this drawer. She's got two drawers of Ulocks like this. So it's just everything references back to the old village. And that's what brings an archeological site to life. It's not when it's sitting in a museum, it's when people are still using these things and still hold the stories. I would meet John Smith and he's a carver in the village. He carves from ivory and wood. And what he would do is every day, he'll go down to the site when they're excavating, he'd find an artifact and be, bring that back to his house. And by the next morning, he will have carved it new. And this is a way of these things coming to life again, right? This is tradition passing on and passing on. So you'd see things like this being made today. And I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna end on the youth. Youth. We actually went back with a National Geographic photo camp and the, um, about 20 to 40 youth in the community got to use cameras and show um, their relationship to their daily life with these cameras and it was they put together an amazing show. These images will get to be used in the museum if they want in their own museum. Um, but what's interesting about the children, so they, they speak a mix, there's a lot of them speak Yupik, but everyone speaks English, so it's a mix of two languages, there'll always be a household with a Yupik uh, first language speaker and English. But what happened was this, is about 80 years ago, um, there, um, there were some changes that went on in the village with, with um, contact from the outside world, and they stopped dancing, they stopped Yupik Eskimo dancing. And when the village started to come up, the Nunalik village started to come out of the ground, the children decided they wanted to dance again because the artifacts were telling them that they should dance again. And so they started to learn the dances. And, he, and they, they say, we don't know them perfectly. We're still relearning these, but we can hear the songs of our ancestors. These are the moves. And they, they say that the, their life is, how should I say, their heritage is coming to life through them. And, um, I went to um, my house and he showed me and I'm going to share day of Mike seal hunting dancing. Well, thank you for coming to Alaska with me. Um, it was amazing and I'm really open uh, to any questions you might have. There, no question is too big or too small. I would love to hear uh, what this meant to you and anything else I can elaborate on, please share with me. Amazing, Erica. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful journey to take today. And two things that you said during that presentation have really stuck out to me. You said, I can't tell you what the story is until I've lived it. But until then, I can tell you what I'm interested in researching. I think that's so cool and challenges a lot of misconceptions folks have about what it means to be a National Geographic storyteller. Wonderful. And the other thing that really stuck with me is what brings a museum to life is when people are still out there using these things and giving them the new life. Just really, really beautiful. Everything that you say could be printed on a like, motivational poster. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and for folks learning along with us at home, we'd love to hear what you loved um, and see what you do with this. Maybe you do a follow-up activity from our family guide. You draw a picture or write a story or start making your own photos and telling your own community stories. Wh whatever it may be, please send it to us on Twitter. You can tag at that geo education and use hashtag explore classroom. And that way we can make sure Erica gets the chance to see all of your amazing work. And now it's time for questions, our very favorite time of the day. Um, if you are watching along on YouTube, you can chat your questions in in the chat bar. Um, some of them have already come through. They're great. Keep them coming. You only need to send each message once, though. We keep track of everything you send us. Please don't spam. We'll put you in timeout. It's a big bummer. Um, and if you're up here on screen with me, get your nice loud voice ready. I'll let you know when it's your turn. But our first question today comes to us from Krish. Uh, and Krish is wondering about the different types of travel that you used when, when, when storytelling in Alaska heard about boats and boat planes and really inaccessible areas. What was your travel like, Erica? 
So there's a, it's a great question because travel is really important and actually traveling is really, I'd say the way that you travel informs your journey and informs your story. So it's a wonderful question. So initially, because I don't live, um, I live in Florida, so I had to get to Alaska by plane. And then, like I mentioned in the beginning, I got to the, the smaller village of Yupik by a smaller prop plane. But once we get there, there's a lot of on foot. So I have these great winter boots. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of on foot that happens. In the summertime, we'll take a lot of boats to go out fishing um, from bigger boats to smaller boats. It just depends if we're gonna go out in the Bering Sea a little bit bigger. Sometimes if we're going on the river, some smaller boats. Um, there could be some ATV use as well. Within the village, to be honest, there's not a lot of vehicles, but there's a handful of trucks, um, trucks that will pick people up at there's an airport there, are small airport trucks that'll pick people up and there's sort of a community trucks that can sometimes be used. So I would hop onto those with the archeologists. Um, bicycles, tricycles, um, what else have I used? And oh, that's probably about it for, for a lot. Oh, and snow machine, of course, I'm sorry, in the winter, snowmobiles. So some, they have, you know, skidoos or snow goes, lots of people have those as well, so. So cool. I've never heard of someone uh, traveling by tricycle. That's really neat. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, let's take our next question from an on-screen group. We've got Anian and Tille. Go for it, folks. What's your question? How many artifacts have you found? Ooh, good question. And I am so bad at numbers. So I'm sure if this is live and Rick and the village of Quinnahawks there, they're going to kill me. Um, but it's, I think it's like upwards of 100,000. It's a lot. And I'm really sorry that I don't have the exact number. If Rick was on, he would have it. It is, but it is, I can say this, it's the largest collection of UPIC artifacts ever, ever, ever put together. So it's, it's quite a lot and it's, it's going to be, um, now, of course, for the village, it's obviously a cultural treasure, um, but, but just in terms of um, in the world, it's an amazing um, kind of encyclopedia of knowledge of, of this part of the world. Awesome. And kind of building off of the how many question, we've got Kareen watching online who's wondering what the oldest artifact you've seen at the site is. Mm, that's another really good question. Um, I can't give you an exact, but we're definitely looking six to 700 years somewhere. And so, um, you know, and you have to imagine, so put that into context of we're talking about Alaska, right? So you're going to see much older stuff if you're if you're talking, you know, in terms of Egypt and places like that. But um, this is what we're kind of coming up with along in 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 this area of the world. They are questioning um, that, that there are some possible closed sites that could be up to a thousand years old, and um, and maybe even a little bit older. But the one important thing, the big thing, not so much about the age, but what's happening here is it is the most, what you're finding kind of different than what you're gonna see over in, in, in uh, Europe and in Asia and that part of the world is because everything's in permafrost, it's so well preserved. So actually they're, they're, they're finding baskets and little, you know, so like baskets and pieces of cloth, like little things are coming out that would have, like for instance, if we found those in the lower 48, we'd never find them. They would have disintegrated by now because they didn't have the ice to preserve them. So actually, sorry, just for one more thing, I don't want to talk, but it's so, there's a, um, so they found, for instance, a, a, a dog that, that had, had been frozen. And so they actually found the fleas. So what they can do, because they're so well preserved, they are testing the bugs and, and, and they're testing it with what bugs are today. So they're able to connect what the climates, what the, what the environmental factors were like then versus now. Um, it's really incredible. So maybe not as important as how old it is, but how well preserved it is. That is awesome. Well, let's take our next question from Kid Conservationist who's up on screen with us. Go for it. So I was wondering, do you have any fun or funny stories about the village in Alaska? <laughs> I have so many fun and silly stories. Um, oh, that's a great question. Well, I have to tell you, anytime I go there, it's, it is always just fun. So everything's pretty silly. Um, what can I say? Like, yes, maybe like me trying to walk in, in, in snow with like a thousand layers on in my backpack, like I'll find myself tripping a lot. And it's like, it's, I don't know why, but 
you know, you think, oh, from National Geographic, like we know what we're doing. It's like, no, I'm usually tripping over myself. Um, and so that's kind of, I don't know, for me, that's funny. Not no one else, they, nobody's laughing at me, but I'm laughing at myself in that regard, right? Um, the other thing that I will say, let's see, fun stories. Oh, well, yeah, like, um, well, the tricycle, but wait, let me think of another good story that's kind of funny. Um, hold on. What would be? Oh, yeah, I can. Okay, so, um, so for instance, you know, just coming to to the food. So, right, every culture has food that is really important to them, and that's sort of part of my job as a storyteller. So, when I go into a new place, I am open to everything. I'm not there and say, oh, I can't eat this. I don't eat that. Like my job is to go there, and anything that's given to me, I will eat. So, um, so it's amazing. So, I've eaten like things called stink heads, which are like a fermented fish from like, um, and then I could then, and the, you know, then you eat like all these amazing berries. So you can be out in tundra and then you get these like berries. And so what's really funny is I just remember um, one time I had eaten the stink heads and um, I, then I went to like a gathering, like a gathering of like women. We were all hanging out together. And this woman came and she's like, oh, I can tell you exactly what you ate. Like she knew by like what, um, but what I, what uh, my hand smelled, like what I had eaten. And I thought this was, it's not that it's funny, but it's really, I think this is really beautiful. Like there's so many ways for us to communicate with people. And then for instance, like nobody in my household has ever done that to me before. My son doesn't come and be like, oh, I know what you ate mama. And I love that. And these are ways for, um, these what I want to say is these become very fun and beautiful ways that we communicate in different parts of the world that are somewhat universal but also um, teach us each culture has something to teach us from 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 these ways so I don't know hopefully that answers it <laughs> awesome we've got Stradut online who's wondering how you deal with jet lag and different climates and all the other challenges that come with traveling for work yeah, so I would say <laughs> probably not the best person to ask that. I actually suffer from jet lag pretty bad. Um, I haven't figured out the magic trick. Um, so uh, my magic trick is like just being really honest because some people, you know, sometimes places you're going, not necessarily everyone's experienced jet lag. So I'll show up somewhere and they might not understand like, wait, why is she still tired? Why is she still, she didn't do anything. I'm like, oh, because I'm on like 12 hour different time zone. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm just pretty much honest with about it. And I try to listen to my body. That's really, really important. I mean, obviously like if I have to get to work, I get to work, um, but I think there's something really important for me to listen to my body and listen to my own health in that. And so if I need a day or two to acclimate myself, it can be extremely important. Now, especially I'm, um, especially if you're working in a bit more extreme conditions, sometimes I can work where it's like negative 40 and just, you know, or work in really hot conditions in the rainforest. And if you don't give yourself a couple days to acclimate, it could actually be dangerous. So you really want to be, I'm kind of kind to myself, listen to myself. Um, and again, and also try to, you know, just eat the best, drink lots of water. <laughs> Always good advice. Let's take a question from Samara, who's up on screen with us. Remember the house you were talking about that was there for generations? Mm -hmm. How many years has been, has that house been there for? So they're estimating somewhere between six to 700 years ago that that house was. And they're actually, so they've been excavating for 10 years. And this summer was supposed to be to get down to the next layer. There's actually another layer that they haven't discovered. So it's not as simple perhaps as I described it as it's one house, the house actually has many layers. And so every year they thought they were on like a final layer and then they realized, no, wait, there's another layer. And this next layer actually represented like a generation before, not just like a decade, but like a several generations before. So there's still another layer to be discovered. Um, I think they're not gonna dig this year because of COVID. So I think they're holding till next year. Um, and so they're thinking that now they're going to be on the final layer next year, but who knows, because they thought this for a while. So, um, so actually, they're still discovering. They think it's a bit older than they even thought. And um, what's very interesting about the layers of the houses is so each layer actually relates to the 
generation and environment that they were living in. So what they're saying is that in the early layers, that they're, the, the la earlier layers they're getting to now, they actually notice the masks and um, some of the faces are smiling a little more. There's like different characteristics that are coming out. Whereas in the later years, when the time that the village went dormant because of um, these resource scarcity, they actually see sort of harsher faces in the mask, things that would have been relating to, to the difficulties that they were, they were experiencing because of um, resource or scarcity. So, um, so that's interesting. So what you're seeing, right, how we as culture relate to our environmental surroundings, and how we express it through our language, through our artwork, and the way that we live. And that's my main goal as a storyteller is to be able to help interpret some of those connections. Awesome. We've got Anthony in the chat bar who's wondering, uh, what tools did villagers use to carve ivory and, and other bone with? Maybe, maybe referencing the storytelling knife? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really wish if I could, and I might be able to easily share this. Oh, I wish I could. I don't know. I don't know if I can do it so quickly. Um, but because I have it. I, so one of them, so it was, well, they had something called, um, actually, sorry. I, it, how are we on time? Are you okay if I just try to, if I might have it right here? I think I do. And I want to share it. It is totally worth the tangent. A, okay. It's such a beautiful tool. Um, so it's a jade piece that was put onto a piece of, of a, like a stick and they would put it in this like kind of contraption in their mouth. And that's how they would get such perfect lines. So when they were making things like earrings, they could do these perfect sort of concentric circles. Um, so yes, and I do have it here. So give me a second. Let me throw this into, and in a minute, I'm gonna bring it up onto the screen. It's gonna take a minute to open up. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen really quick for everybody. And here we go. Um, do, we, do we see that? There we go. So there's one of the tools that they would potentially use to carve. And their precision, for instance, on earrings and um, different things they would have used to adorn themselves on their knives, like my storytelling knife, they would have had this kind of beautiful precision. And this, so basically the tip of this, not the jade, so that's a piece of jade on the top. The bottom part would have gone in their mouth and they would have kind of directed it something like this. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really incredible. One thing that, um, that John Smith says, the gentleman you saw in the picture that was holding the tusks that I said is the, 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 the carver today, he would say, he always goes, how my ancestors did it, I have no idea. Like he just always marvels at what tools they had and what beauty they were able to create. He says he couldn't even begin to touch that level today. So cool. I'm so glad you pulled up that picture. That is not what I was imagining at all. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's cool. go to the Kuster family for, for their question. Go for it, folks. Um, yeah, we each have a question. My question was, um, I've learned about how the Hawaiians did the hula and all different dances to share their stories. Um, did the people of Alaska do, do the dances to share stories like the seal dance? Absolutely. So dancing is about storytelling. Um, and I don't want to speak for, for, for people themselves because it's dancing is something different for each individual family and each individual community. So it's really important that we distinguish that like there's Yupik, Anupiak, there's many different groups within Alaska, many different native groups. Um, and so dancing would mean something different to each group but i would say in general i think we could summarize that dancing was a way to communicate to story tell um it was also a way to enact different levels of 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 healing within the community and communications with um the natural world around them and the the spiritual world around them that was really important um and so Today, what you're seeing is there's something called a dance fan. And so a lot of the, um, the UPIT communities um, have these two, um, and I actually have some in the other room. I wish I would have known that question. I would have it sitting right here. But they make these beautiful dance fans. Um, and they, they use those to, to, 
to um, to communicate within these dancing, and it's a way for them to also um, kind of communicate between um, their with their ancestors and today, and it, it kind of connects them. And so a lot of these dances have that in mind, but then of course, then it, it will communicate like the seal hunting dance or, or some, some other activity that would go on in the community that was very important. So cool. And while we're with the Cooster family and your mic is on, do you want to ask one more right now? Um, yeah, I was wondering how do they excavate with the permafrost? Because I know it's like frozen over. So how do they get the artifacts out without like ruining them? Mm -hmm. Good question. So um, what I didn't mention, and I probably should have in the beginning, so there's about a six week dig, dig time each year. So that's also why this is sort of crucial because you got you have six weeks to dig and then you've got the entire rest of the year for erosion in the Bering Sea to take to take what isn't protected. So so it's actually it is sort of that's why the title of this is racing the thaw, <laughs> because it really is a bit of a race, race, race of time, you know. Um, so during those six weeks, um, it's kind of what you would probably to be the best time of the year, the warmest time of the year. So that's why they do it. And it's usually about the beginning of July to early August. Um, but yeah, but then they can, they can hit ice. Um, so depending, obviously they're not pushing anything, um, too much, but if something's sort of half out of the ground, they'll bring some, and I could be speaking wrong. I, I want to say they're just bringing regular water in that's, uh, that's warm and kind of boiling some stuff down, but I'm not the archeologist and that water might be treated or not. I'm but but I will say they're bringing in warmer water um, if something is really stuck in ice and they kind of have to get it out then um, they're doing a bit of that but in general they're they're waiting on the warm weather of the year to act as um, you know to kind of act as the the icebreaker so to speak um, and what you'll find is that there was enough kind of breakdown and warmth from the year before that a lot of stuff is already just sitting out of the ground so a lot of it's just digging really cool well, let's take our next question from Nikita, who's up here with us. Go for it, Nikita. Okay, yeah. So my question was, how are the native people dealing with climate change and like the icebergs melting? So yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, or a couple of things I should say that have been expressed to me. One, the one, most actually one thing, and I work in a lot of different um, in a lot of different communities that have close connections to nature and actually all parts of the world, but I do concentrate a bit in the Arctic. And one of the things I kind of hear in Arctic communities across the board is that, you know what, we've been adapting forever. Like that is who we are. We are people to, to have existed in climates like this. You had to be an adaptive culture, right? So I, I think that's really, and people are, are a bit ignoring this in, 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 in this question, you know, we are adaptable. And so that's the first thing. I think that's their first sort of armor, if you want to say, or their, you know, first sort of sword in this, this challenge of, of climate change is, is that they're just adaptable and recognize that. And so, um, um, and, and then on top of that, you know, what else you're seeing is, yeah, so you are seeing, you're seeing warm, so you're seeing season switch. So they're kind of how should I say? Um, well, I'd say they use communication a lot to help them. So for instance, I'll give you an example. In the summertime is fish camp. And fish camp is important. It's when everybody gets together and they go out fishing and then they collect and they might smoke their fish, salt their fish. But basically this is where they gather. It's kind of the hunting and gathering season, the fishing and gathering season. And so that they can kind of preserve this food for the rest of the year. When, when, you know, those kind of fish, the king salmon are in, in run. But what will happen is, so you're maybe seeing some of these seasons switch a little, like the runs are a little bit earlier than they used to be. So they communicate with each other. So someone will go out and in the minute, oh, the king salmon are running here. This gets passed down from camp to camp so that everyone's not like, oh, wait, wow, it's a month early. Everybody knows. So there's also this open line of communication that I think is really important. And that, that's when you live, I think, in, in, in communities that are much closer to the natural world or where you, you have to really live with the cycles of nature there's this idea of this like singular person it doesn't really it's not very helpful right you have to be communally 
um, working together. So I think that's been really strategic and also looking ahead, right? So this adaptability, this kind of communication, a lot of the, the community realizes that, that they're going to have to move their houses. And this is happening all along the villages on the Bering Sea. It's not just Quinnahop. And so they're doing some, some planning and what does that look like? Some engineering and um, some financial planning. So some deep architecture in that. And what does it mean to move this village? Um, so it's, it, and scientifically as well. So there's a lot of levels going on from cultural to scientific research to um, which I, what I would want to kind of say cultural, traditional knowledge, scientific research, art, you know, um, uh, engineering and all of these things. So. Yeah. Thank you. And let's visit the Filman family for a question. Um, uh, engineering. What does permafrost only affect Alaska? No, it doesn't, but it affects, um, well, actually, to be honest, permafrost is going to affect everybody in the world um, because, right, everything, our world's all connected. So something that happens in one area, we might not see a direct kind of, you know, uh, effect somewhere else, but you'll see sort of, what do you say, like an aug or like an auxiliary like effect, right? So if you see permafrost melt, then you might be, you know, starting to, or like icebergs melting, right? You're going to start seeing rising sea level, which affects me here in Miami. So every, I think it affects everybody. Um, but maybe if your question is more specific, of like the seeing of permafrost. So we're seeing that, you know, all along the, the Arctic region, Siberia, um, you know, Canada. Um, but in, yeah, in the U.S., you're seeing it in Alaska. And I think, well, actually, you know, we're seeing it in some other regions as well. But those would be those would kind of, you know, these Arctic regions where we're seeing kind of tundra and permafrost. Awesome. And we've got Krish online who's now wondering what the strangest thing you found or learned during the storytelling project was. Well, strangest thing that I found or learned. Um, huh, let's say this, it's not a material thing. The strangest thing would be that um, I think I found like how should I say, like, every story becomes a bit a part of my heart and becomes like a part of my home. So I realized that like, and you know, after working there for five years, like, I can identify or I can say like, it's as part of Quinnahawk is as much a part, feels as much a part of home to me as my own home. And I think that's what storytelling is for me, right? I don't, I'm not trying to say that I am you pick or Quinnahawk is my home. But what I mean is that, um, these stories become such a part of, of me, the, the, the gift that's being shared to me by, by me being able to spend time there and to learn, this becomes, five years becomes my life as well. And so therefore, this becomes a part of me. And I never would have thought that going to Quinnahawk in 2015 would therefore be a part of my life. And this happened, and I find time after time, um, this happens. And so I think that's the strange thing because you never expect that going out, that the story also becomes a bit of your story. And I don't mean narcissistically either your story. I just mean that everything, that's the beauty of the collectiveness of storytelling, right? It's each person individually holds these stories and they're kind of the keeper of this beautiful parts of their culture. But once something is shared, like you get to reflect in it and you, you get a bit of it as well. And then that passes on, it comes back into my home and I share that with my son and in the way that I choose to live my life. So um, it's strange and that's beautiful and I get surprised every time it happens, even though I shouldn't, but that's it. I love it. And Erica, do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there? Yeah, I would just say yes, for sure. <laughs> no, what I would say is, um, how should I say this? Really, I really, I don't mean to push storytelling, but I really believe, I believe storytelling is one of the oldest traditions around. I mean, it's more than 10,000 years old, right? And each one of us is a storyteller. It just depends what tools we have um, and what tools we end up discovering along our path in life and that we put into our backpack and we use. But understand that you all have a story to tell and to share, but a big part of storytelling is not only us sharing ourselves, but also making the time to be silent and to listen. 
And um, my one bit of advice that I always give myself is never ask anybody for more than you're willing to give of yourself. And when, especially in the tradition of storytelling, I think you'll find that that fares really beautifully when there's as much being given as there is being taken and it becomes a very cyclical um, story in exchange, so. Well, Erica, I think we could ask you questions probably all day long and still have more, but thank you so much for the time that you've spent with us. This has been an awesome journey to Alaska. I think we all need a little bit of escapism right now. And for folks at home, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Be sure to be sharing your work with us on Twitter, and we hope to see you at our upcoming events. Happy Pride Month, everyone. And now it's time to sign off. So everybody up on screen with me, go ahead and turn your microphones on. Let's get nice and loud right here at the end as we say goodbye and thank you to Erica. Ready? Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.